Okay. Right, this morning, we're going to look at something a little bit different and try and get into your minds. Your minds, incredible minds. I'm one of those guys that crosses the days off on a wall calendar. Anybody else do that? You do that? Huh? Nobody else? No? Sorry? What was that? Uh, some remaining we have to... I didn't... Your grandpa. Your grandpa. Okay, I remind you of your grandpa. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, as and when I do it, which I you know, do every other day or daily or weekly, whenever it is, when I'm sitting at my desk, um, I often think right, that one day, one day, one of those days is going to be the rapture. It's quite incredible, isn't it? Imagine, I mean, what are we now? We're on the Sunday the 15th of April. Imagine, you know, say the 25th of April would be the rapture. Imagine that. You know, you're just living life normally, then you're going to hit the 25th, you're perhaps you're just about to cross through, or you're going to just enter into that day, and then suddenly the rapture happens. That's the end, that's the calendar. Anybody after can have my calendar if they want it. But that's the rapture. Could you imagine that? So one day, you know, in a calendar, in, a, in, our, in our calendar, that's going to be the rapture. I find that quite incredible. And every time I cross it off, I think, that's another day nearer. It is amazing that we're going to go very, very soon. Imagine what it's going to be like. I get quite excited about that. Sometimes, you know, I'll, I haven't sat at my desk for three or four days for some reason. And then um, I go there and I have to cross off four. And I'm thinking, I've just crossed off four days, 24 hours a day. That's life. That's gone. That's, that's my life. And yet you've all had your 24 hours as well. The whole world's had their 24 hours. And I'm just crossing off a day. Somebody in, you know, London, New York, Paris, wherever, they've had their day as well. We're just crossing it off. Another day of life. Another day I'm getting older. Another day I'm getting towards the rapture. I find that quite fascinating. just makes you think a little bit deeper. Life is quite funny. It's quite strange at times. We have all entered, just in this room this morning, we have all entered each other's lives. Our paths have crossed. We've known just you two, for instance, two years? Is it two years? Oh, and counting. And uh, <laughs> you're crossing your time off, aren't you? Um, a year and a half, yeah? A year and a half we've known each other. For the last 30-odd years, we've never, we've never knew each other existed. It's quite funny, isn't it? Uh, could we stop doing that, please? And, uh, and um, so for 30 years, we never even knew you existed. And you never knew we did. And now our paths have crossed. The Lord's brought us into each other's life. I find that quite fascinating when you start thinking about that. And somehow we've impacted each other. Same with ourselves. We've impacted each other. We've had, you know, um, we've made a difference perhaps on each other's lives in some way. Whether it's the way we think or whether we do things, whatever. We all decide, we all decide what we're going to share with each other how much we're going to open up and tell each other about ourselves, about our lives. You know, I've had 47 years of life. What do you know about my life? What have I shared with you? What have I told you about it? Are you interested? Maybe not. Maybe you are. I don't know. But you decide on what you tell me and I decide on what I tell you. It's a choice. I want to get to know you. I want to open you up. I want to find out what makes you tick. I'm interested in people. I really am interested in in people. And we all shut each other out of certain things. There are doors in your life and my life that are closed, that you're not allowed in. You're not allowed into that that room. You're not welcome there. Isn't that strange? Why? Because they're personal. Personal things. Maybe things that you're ashamed of, whatever it is. But you're not welcome there. There's one part of your life that no one can really enter, not even your closest to you, not even your loved ones. I can get into your life physically in the sense of like, you know, where we are now, we have a day of life together, we're sitting in a room here, we're at church, we're interactive with one another. But I can't get into your mind, and you can't get into mine. Your thought life. Wouldn't that be interesting? Wouldn't it be interesting if you could? I'd love to get into your thought life. I'd love to know what you're thinking right now. 
especially you. Could you imagine what it would be like if we could have a day, just a day, that, especially you, a day where you could just enter your thought life, especially you. Imagine we all could say, right, tomorrow we're going to enter Christian's thought life. We're going to just see the way he thinks from the moment he wakes up to the moment he goes to bed at night. We're going to see every thought. We're going to view everything that he's going through his head. When he's at work, when he's having his panini, or he's Italian, and whatever he's doing, how is he? He's probably thinking, oh, I've had this again, this is done. <laughs> I wonder what he thinks. A 24-hour viewing of someone else's thought life. Would you be embarrassed? I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure whether I believe that, but anyway, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's all kinds of te- technology. Can you actually get into somebody's mind? I know the devil can get into our minds at times, but can anybody physically? Can any computer? I don't know. But it'd be interesting if we could. Would you be embarrassed? Would you be ashamed the way you are, the way you think? You know, all through, all, for a 24 hour period, all the millions of things that you think that pass through your mind, It's quite incredible, isn't it? Turn to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. Verse 1. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting, mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. He knows everything about you. Everything about you, God knows. Every single thought that goes through your mind, God knows. Wow. Thoughts, words, deeds, everything you do. Everything you are, what you think, where you go, the times where you try and hide things, God knows everything. Everything is laid naked and open before God. Have we changed much from the days of Adam, Noah, right at the beginning? Well, if you turn to Genesis 6, verse 5, we read this, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Have we changed? Genesis 8.21 And the Lord <clears throat> smelled a sweet savour, And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I again smite any more anything, everything living as I have done. uh, The imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Youth, it says. Not baby or child, youth. That's interesting. How do you see yourself? How do you see yourself this morning? Do you like yourself? Or have you got fake humility? Or are you arrogant? What kind of person are you? How do you see yourself? Have you more strengths than weaknesses? Or is it vice versa? Have you more weaknesses than strengths? Would you class yourself as a real dedicated and committed Christian? Honestly. If you would or do, does your life reflect that? These are just a few thoughts I was having just sitting at my desk yesterday. Does your life reflect that? In contrast, turn to Acts 20. You call yourself a Christian? Acts chapter 20. You're a committed, dedicated Christian, are you? Always abounding in the work of the Lord. 
always thinking about the Lord, are you? You want to please God in everything you do, from the moment you get up to the moment you go to bed at night? You're a real Christian, are you? Look at Acts 20, let's read this. Let's read about Paul. And after the uproar was ceased, Paul called unto him his disciples, embraced them, and departed for to go into Macedonia. Why is he going? On holiday? Do you have holidays? What's wrong with holidays? You need recuperation, don't you? (laughs) And when he had gone over those parts and had given them much exhortation, he came into Greece. Already he's leaving for a journey. He's not drifting. He's not in the wilderness. He's going for a purpose. He's just seen these people. He's exhorting them. He's teaching them. And there abode three months, and there abode three months. And when the Jews laid wait for him, as he was about to sail into Syria, that's in the news all the time now, he purposed to return through Macedonia. Why is he going? Why is he going to these places? What's the reason? What's his motive? Why does he travel? And they accompanied him into Asia, Sephata, Sephata, of Berea, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius, and Derby, and Timotheus of Asia, and Tychicus, and Trophimus. They accompanied him. Why is he taking these people with him? Why do you take people with you? Where you go, do you? Those going before tarried for us at Troas. And we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread and came unto, came unto them to Troas in five days. Five days. They are. They should ticking off. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Five days Paul had there. What's he doing in those five days? Travelling? Sightseeing? Doing a newsletter? On his laptop? What's he doing? Five days, where we abode seven days. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, straight away they're having fellowship together, all the time, fellowship, serving, preaching, teaching, exhorting, worshipping, loving. Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Heck of a long sermon. Well, I've been preaching for now, or talking to you for 14 minutes. Anybody bored yet? Can you all put your hands down? 14 minutes. He's preaching and teaching till midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a a certain young man named Eutychus. Eutychus. Being fallen into a deep sleep. (laughs) He fell asleep. One of Paul's sermons. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. He fell out the window three stories high, dead, because of Paul's preaching. (coughs) Don't you fall asleep in my sermons or fall off the table. And Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. (laughs) Living for the Lord, was he? When he therefore was come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. So the guy rises from the dead. Of course, we've got signs of wonders today just the same, haven't we? (laughs) Oh dear. And they brought the young man alive. Here we come. And were not a little comforted. I bet they were. And we went before to ship and sailed unto Asos. They're intending to take in Paul, for so he, for so had he appointed, minding himself to go afoot. And when he met with us at Asos, we took him in and came to Mytilene, Mytilene. And we sailed thence and came the next day over against Chios. And the next day we arrived at Samos and tarried at, man alive, these words, 
Choglium. And the next day we came to Miletus. For Paul had determined, determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. He was living for the Lord in everything he did. He had his time plan. He knew what he was doing, where he was going, and what he wanted to achieve. He was determined. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church all the time. It's ministry. His life is ministry. He's not worried about what curtains he's putting up or what he's got, you know, uh, feed the cat and take the dog and, you know, and the cars and the houses and the DIY and all this stuff. He's living for the Lord. Well, things are different today. Yes, they are. But I'm asking you, perhaps indirectly, but we're going to get there in a second, is how do you contrast in regard to a life of service, dedication, and you call yourself a committed Christian, does your life reflect it? When they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came unto Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind, is that you? And with many tears, when was the last time you cried, and what for? And temptations befell me by the lying weight of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. Are you like that as Christians? Or do you like to keep things back because you want to get one up on it? It comes back to motive. You know more than somebody else, do you? Oh, he knows more. He's good, he is. He knows more. <laughs> For what? What, what, what are you getting? A, you're getting self-glory out of this? You're getting a kick out of this because you know more than somebody else? Is that what it's about? Fighting on YouTube and trying to score points? Is that what it's about, do you think? The Lord's interested in that kind of stuff? I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. If you learn something, do you share it? Do you teach it? Do you show people and not being condescending? But you say, hey, look, look what I've learned. Look what I picked up. I've never seen this before. Or do you like that you keep it back and you just wait for the right time? Motive. Most Christians are pathetic. But have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God. Paul preached repentance. Good night, Vienna on the hypers. And faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you think that's faith and works? <laughs> You're dumb. The hypers are dumb. Hyper dispensationist, hyper Calvinist, they're dumb. And now behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. Not knowing the things that shall befall me there. This is ministry. You know, we're not talking about these hypers like fake Fenniger and all this stuff and Colic Colwell sitting in their bedrooms on laptops on YouTube and just doing their little bit and making out they're attacking the world and getting 200, 200 out of 7 billion hits. Whoa. Just dumb. This is ministry. Paul's living. He's out there. He's, he's seeking God's will and he's determined to fulfill God's will in his life. He's totally active. Man, he ain't stopped, is he? You call yourself a dedicated, committed Christian? What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? (laughs) And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, He was a fanatic for the Lord. So that I might finish my course, he's dedicated, with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. He was committed to getting the gospel of the grace of God, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Not faith and works, just faith alone in getting out to sinners. Not competing with other Christians. Paul didn't have a YouTube channel. I don't know if any of you realise that. (laughs) He was only on Twitter. Oh, you don't find that funny. You're sad people, you are. That's because you feel convicted, because none of you are living as you should. (laughs) And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God. Preaching the kingdom of God. Not the kingdom of heaven. There's a difference shall see my face no more. 
Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Don't harp on about your little pet doctrines. If you're going to preach and teach or you're going to um, learn the scriptures and that, you're going to share with others you, the, all the counsel of God. Don't harp on about one or two little things. Get a balance. There's so many unbalanced Christians. Verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his God's own blood. The blood that ran through Jesus Christ's veins was God's blood. Not A, B, negative. (laughs) For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. People will come in to try and destroy. Not just in church, but in your life. People will try. You've got to watch everything. You've got to be on your guard all the time. You don't drop your guard in this life. You better do it when you're in heaven, of course. But in this life, you've got to put your guard up. You've got to watch. You've got to have a little bit of standing space here. And somebody comes into your life, you've got to watch, you've got to figure out. I think it was you, did you take our literature before you came here and read through some of the stuff? He checked us out. He still turned up. <laughs> he checked us out. You've got to check people out to see what they preach and teach, to see where they stand, what their motives is, why they like it. And you can press buttons, you can ask questions... And then you can see the real person. We've had people leave here, you know that. You press a couple of buttons, you do something, and they go mad. They go mad. Like rabid dogs. Suddenly, off the way they go. Never to be seen again. Grievous wolves, they enter in among you, not sparing the flock. They're there to destroy. This is ministry. This is ministry that Paul's in. Life and death he's dealing with all the time. And he's serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. That's what they want. This is what YouTube wants. They get their little setups, you know. Whoever they are goes on you, their little channels, and they get their little disciples. And then occasionally you'll see one disciple leave there and jump to another one like this. You see it. Pathetic. Oh, I got him, I got him. This is this is Christianity for them. This is their ministry. This joke. It's an absolute joke. It's so childish, so babyish. They're not mature Christians. Paul was doing ministry. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Tears again. He's very sincere. He's totally committed and dedicated to the Lord and to doing and fulfilling the Lord's will in his own personal life. He's very sincere. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I've coveted no man's silver or gold or power. He wasn't interested in money or clothing. He's not interested in that. He didn't want that. He just wants to serve the Lord. You want the careers? You want the, the gold and the silver and you want to run and do your own thing? Well, you do it. But that's, you know, not, that's not the will of God. Do you think God's interested in the way you look in the sense of what kind of clothes you're wearing? Of course, you know, we're not saying, grow up, yeah, grow up. I mean, he likes the way you're dressed, yeah, and the hair. I've coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yeah, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. He worked, he earned. He was a tent maker, he did his jobs, he earned his money and he used his money for the Lord's service. He wasn't interested in a career. He wasn't interested in hoarding money and banking money. Do you think Paul had a good old bank account? Lashings of, <laughs> of money in it. Pressing his pin number and getting a tenner out here and there. Do you think that was Paul? I've showed you all things. How that's so labouring, you ought to support the weak. What do you do with your money? What do you do with your life? When you earn something, what are you spending your money on? And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Christians got that wrong. It's more more blessed to receive than to give. (laughs) Keep giving. The Lord gives you more give. Use it. 
Spend it. If you ain't got it, get it. Then spend it. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. He never stopped. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. Sorry most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. That's a great chapter. That's ministry. He's totally committed. Right, now, in contrast to that, Paul, what do you think Paul's thought life was like that? I said to you, you know, spend a 24-hour period and getting into all your minds. Yeah? What would that be like? What do you think Paul's thought life was like in Acts 20, when he's going through all of that? What do you think he was thinking about? Material wealth? What do you think Paul was interested in? Compare your life now to Paul's. Interests. What are your interests? If I said to you, what are your interests this morning? Write down on a piece of paper your interests. Compared to Paul, what was Paul interested in? What are your aims, goals in life? What are your ambitions? Compare that to Paul's. Work, job, career? What do you think Paul? What if I said to Paul, what do you, work, job, career? How do you think about that, Paul? Motives. We talked about that. Why you do things? Why did Paul do things? For what? Are you, do you have a clear conscience? Are your motives right? Sport and recreation. Oh, well, we've got to keep that, you know, bodily exercise, profit us little. You know, we've got to do our little bit down the gym. What do you go down the gym for? Keep fit. You want a few biceps, do you? A few little triceps? <laughs> do you want that, do you? To look good? You all want a body like mine? Sorry? For what? To go out there so you can take your t-shirt off when you put the washing up? <laughs> in the, on the washing on the line? So your neighbours look at you and say, whoa, what a hunk. Sport and recreation. Want a game of football, dear? We were in Jersey, we said to one young lad, was he, who was, um, working in the hotel, what do you do, what do you do with your, um, spare time? And all he did was sit on his computer games. That's all he did. He did his job, then he sat on computer games all night. <laughs> Think Paul was like that? Holidays. Well, he travelled loads of places, didn't he, Paul? Do you think he's going on holidays? Oh, we're just going to see the sights, because, um, well, you know, <laughs> lovely. <laughs> lovely. Holidays. Some people have more than one, two, three, four holidays a year. It's lovely, isn't it? Beautiful. Am I saying holidays are wrong? Of course I'm not. You've got to enjoy yourself. Just enjoy yourself. Just have a nice time. Money. Oh, you can't talk about money. You always talk about money. They all say that, don't they? You, the church is always talking about money. Hey, listen, do what you want. Don't bother me, none. Do what you want with your money. You haven't got an answer to me. What do you spend it on? What about friendship and fellowship? Compare your friendships and fellowship with how Paul would have seen it. Church. How do you see church compared to Paul? Family commitments. Oh, I've got to go to my family commitments. Well, my mum and dad says I've got to be here, you know, I've got to do these things. Do you think Paul went to his family commitments and that? DIY and gardening. Imagine Paul hanging a few shelves, you know, like old Charlie does. <laughs> hey, doing the gardening, weeding, making it look good, putting the roses up. Oh, that's lovely. Doing a good job there, Paul. Don't, I don't read much about that in, in the Bible, funny enough. Clothing and fashion. Lovely. Cars and houses, entertainment, TV, internet. Tracks on the gospel. How do you compare your life with somebody like Paul? Turn to Philippians 1. You call yourself a Christian, do you? Dedicated and committed, are you? Really? Philippians 1, verse 21. Look at this. For me, for to me to live is Christ. For to me, Paul, to live is Christ. Is that really you? And to die is gain. And I die, and it's gain. Verse 23, for I'm in a strait betwixt two. Having a desire to depart, I want to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says, and to be with Christ, which is far better. Who lives like that today? Do you? 
You're a joke, aren't you? Compared to Paul, you are a complete joke, and so am I. Who lives like Paul? Well, there we are, then we don't have to. None of us can attain that. No, but are you giving your best? Are you really giving your best? Or are you half-hearted? Pleasing your family, pleasing your kids, pleasing other people around you more than the Lord? What Christian do you know who really impresses you with the life they live? What Christian? Can you think of anybody who impresses you with the life they live? (laughs) Difficult, isn't it? Let's get back to your thought life. Get into your minds. Stop looking at my notes, please. I saw that. You have to watch here. Turn to Psalm 10. Psalm 10. Psalm 10, verse 4. The wicked through the, through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. They're wicked. They're people that don't seek after God, they're wicked. God is not in all his thoughts. Is he in yours? Is God in all your thoughts? Whatever you do. You wake up, brush your teeth, put your clothes on, go to work. On the way to work, you drive. Is God in all your thoughts? What do you do? Are you thanking and praising the Lord for another day of life? You go through your job. When you're involved in doing your job, are you thinking about the Lord? It's difficult, isn't it? I'm doing my sales presentation. Am I thinking about the Lord? God is not in all his thoughts. Don't you want him to be? Turn to Psalm 92. Psalm 92. Verse 5. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night. Sorry, I'm at 90. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for Melissa for correcting me. 92 verse 5. O Lord, how great are thy works, and thy thoughts are very deep. Are you a deep thinker? You know, some people, it's like when, again, when we're in Jersey, we're challenging this guy who's in the hotel. We're trying to get him to think deeper, rather than this shallow. And he's, he's, and he actually was saying, you know, I found out so much about myself. Because he, he's on this shallow playing field, And he doesn't go any deeper. And we need to be challenged. We need to be taken deeper. We should, you know, deep call us unto deep. We want the deep stuff. Or maybe we don't, but I want the deep stuff in life. I want to know. It's a shallow plastic world and I'm not interested in it. I want to know that, you know, when I used to go to these sales meetings, conferences, all this stuff, I hated it. I absolutely hated it. Because it's so plastic and shallow. People trying to be somebody and making out what, you know, these things are really important. And I found it very difficult to cope with. Have you got a deep thought life? Are you deep as a person? Or are you shallow? Psalm 94, verse 11. The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man, that they are vanity. Well, we've just gone through the whole book of the Ecclesiastes, haven't we? Just put them on MP3. You can have a free copy if you want one. And um, we looked at the ten vanities that Solomon lists. Ten vanities. And yet these ten vanities, even Christians that we know and, you know, close to us and you know, I'm sure, they're still chasing after the vanities. The vanities of life. Backslidden Christians, that's what they are. Vain. Ah, brother. They just miss it. Psalm 119, verse 113. I hate vain thoughts. Do you? I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Do you? Do you love the word of God? Do you love the law of God? Or are you into the world? Are you into worldliness, careers, material possessions, money? Fame, prestige, what are you into?
vanity. Psalm 139. I'm just giving you a few verses just to finish with. Psalm 139. Verse 23 and 24. Search me, O God. Could you say this? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Would you pray that prayer? Is there any wickedness in you? Do you want God to search you or are you embarrassed? Like we said before, there's rooms that we don't let other people into. In your life. You know, even when you're married, there's certain things, you know, even in your own life. Why are you smiling? Even in your own life, yeah? There's, you know, I, you want to go in, you say, like, I want to I wanna go in that room. And she's saying, you're not coming in here. Even the closest people to you. The door is locked on certain things. Why? I'm not trying to do this sermon just to expose my wife, but... Um, <laughs> we'll have a little chat afterwards, shall we, dear? But um, you all have barriers that you put up. You know, husband, wife, friends, whatever. I mean, <laughs> you want to get in. You want to find out how people tick. But you can only go so far. Only God knows. You can only go so far with each other. Turn to Proverbs 16. It's an interesting one. Proverbs 16. <clears throat> These are great verses, aren't they? Verse 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. How about that? Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. We looked at um, Proverbs 3, didn't we? 5 and 6 was it today. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. We're going to finish with that brilliant verse. Um, regarding thoughts at the end. Everything you do, you ought to be talking to the Lord about it. Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21, verse 5. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenty, plenteousness, plenteousness, but of everyone that is hasty only to want. Again, we could spend time on each one of these. Look at this. The thoughts of the diligent. Are you diligent? Tend only to plenteousness. You're putting the Lord first. He has preeminent position in your life. You're living for him. And everything's going according to plan. You're fulfilling God's will in your life. But of everyone that is hasty, only to want. See, if you're diligent, I'm not talking about material wealth or blessings here and that. But what I'm saying, you're, if you're diligent, you get plenty. But of everyone that is hasty, only one. People want a quick buck today. People want, you know, we all want more money to do more things, but people, people cut corners, you know. Why do people steal? Steal off other people because they don't want to work for a living. People do the lottery because they want a quick kill. You know, they want to make that money. Hastiness, only to want. Isn't it interesting, again, was it Philippians 2 or Philippians 4, it says, you know, about being content with what you have. I know how to abase and how to abound, Paul says. In all things, Paul understood. It's ministry. He lived for God in everything. On the back of Proverbs 21, 5, Matthew 6, Matthew chapter 6, let me just read to you this, Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's putting the Lord first in everything. His will. Colossians 2, you know, putting him in the preeminent position. He's the body. That in all things he might have the preeminence. That's what it talks about. Let me read you another one. Isaiah 55, verse 7 to 9. In fact, we'll go 6. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Then he goes on to say, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I want to think like the Lord wants me to think. And do his will. Please God, help me to think as I should. Help me to love and care and have mercy and forgiveness as I should. 
We want to be good ambassadors for the Lord, don't we? Or have you given up? You're not bothering anymore. Isaiah 65, 2, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. God, he puts, he's got his open arms out to this rebellious people and still because of their own thoughts, the way they are, the way they live, they're not interested in God. It's tragic. It's so sad. Yet this is life. This is the kind of people we are mixing with, that have no thought. The people that you rub shoulders with at work, they have no thought about God. It's so sad. And they're heading towards destruction. Jeremiah 6.19 Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts. The fruit of their thoughts. How about that one? Because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to the law, but rejected it. They've rejected God's law, God's words, God's holy scriptures, and they've, they're going to reap the fruit of their thoughts. They put themselves above the word of God. Tragic, isn't it? Headed towards destruction. Headed towards destruction. Turn to Micah. Micah 4. Verse 12 and 13. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord. Do you? Do you know what God wants from your life? Do you know the thoughts, how God thinks? Neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Do you know the counsel of God? Do you know his thoughts? Do you know how he wants you to think, you to live. Matthew 9, nearly through. Matthew 9, verse 4. We're just looking at thoughts, our thought life. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? He knew their thoughts. He knew their thoughts. He could get in to their mind. He understood. He was God in the flesh, of course. And then Matthew fifteen nineteen. For out of the heart proceedeth, listen, out of your thoughts, your mind and your heart, they're connected. It's connected with your mouth as well, after the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you think you are, what you feed upon, it's all connected. For out of the heart, uh, Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. And these are the things which defile a man. And I've got a cross-reference there of Luke 24, 38. Luke 24. Let's just have a quick look at that. 24, 38. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Your thoughts, your minds, arise in your hearts. It's connected. So what you feed upon, you become like. What kind of person are you? Are you a dedicated Christian? Just like Acts 20 we read with regard to Paul? Or you part-time, half-hearted, milksop, backslidden Christian, fulfilling your own will in your own life. And you have to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account. If you really thought about that, you'd terrify you. Mark 7.21 For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murder, and it goes on. What's your thought life like? What kind of Christian are you? What are you doing for God? What are you achieving in your life for the Lord? What fruit are you bearing? When was the last time you led a soul to the Lord? When was the last time you gave out gospel tracts? How committed are you to serving the Lord? How committed are you to the local church where you go? Or are you isolated trying to do it alone because you think you're right and everybody else is wrong? What testimony are you? What kind of ambassador for the Lord are you? Hebrews 4.12, this is an interesting one. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even into the dividing asunder of the soul and, of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. You read the book, the book reads you. This book reads you. Amazing. Okay, we're nearly through. Turn back to Psalms. The Psalms. Psalm 49. 
just a few thoughts for us to look at our own lives. Psalm 49, verse 10 and 11. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Do you think Paul was like that? Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. They love themselves so much they call their own properties, their businesses after their own names and then they just think that as they're going to die, it's just, you know, they think these things will continue on forever. Isn't it amazing where people put all their money in banks and then banks go bust? <laughs> Remember the first bank that went bust? Fighting the world to death. How can a bank with all money in go bust? Nobody can understand it. If you're putting all your security and all your faith and trust in men to look after money for you, and that goes bust, man, what, what faith and security have you got? What's, you know, what is sound in your life? Psalm 119, back there. Psalm 119. Are you keeping up? Well, oh, she's doing well. Look at her go, look at her go. Psalm 119, verse 59. Are you there, Melissa, or not? Verse 59, Psalm 119, verse 59. Are you there? Read it. Brilliant. I thought on my ways. Your thought life, your mindset. I thought on my ways, what you think is best, and turned my feet until I testified. It's like you've repented, you did a 180, and you're thinking, listen, this ain't the way to go. My feet until I testified. The best thing you can do is put your, put your thoughts into the scriptures, put your time and effort into the scriptures and ask God to guide you in making the right decisions. We all mess up. I mess up so often. You know, I don't put the Lord first. I try and do things my own way. Matthew 6, verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air that they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them, are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Neither I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not... Much more clothe you, O ye of little faith. That's me at times, O little faith. Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall ye eat, or what shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye need, have need of all these things. God knows what we need. It's not about what we want, it's what we need. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the moral shall take thought for the things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That's brilliant wording, isn't it? Three more verses, I'm finished. We worry too much about the mundane, we worry too much about the material stuff, paying the bills. That's why originally I didn't want to set up a company, I didn't want to get consumed by having a company. I wanted to fulfil God's will in my life, and then when I had the opportunity of doing it and setting up a company... And I do believe it is the Lord's will, but I was scared that it was going to take too much of my time. And it does take too much of my time, but I'm trying to balance it out now. But it's difficult, as a Christian, to run a business, in my opinion. I've got to trust the Lord more. 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Too many Christians are like children still. They have childish thoughts. When I was a child, I spoke as a, I understood as a, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away... Listen, you've got to man up. There's too many Christians that are still childish. You've got to man up. Grow up. 
Don't be so pathetic. I find children, um, children, I find Christians so much like children. They're so babyish at times. Sticks and stone and bang, bang, bang. <laughs> oh, it's just pathetic. Honestly, there, there, there's, there's not like many men within the church. It's, no wonder men, you know, in the, because there's not many in the church, they don't attract other blokes, you know, to come in. It's not like a, a manly thing. It's such an effeminate Christianity today. It's so sad. Because the way it's dumbed down and the preachers we've got in the pulpit, they're pathetic. Anemic, puerile, sterile. I'll finish with two verses. In fact, I want to finish with our, my favourite in regard to all of this. I want to keep your finger in 2 Corinthians 10, if you're there, and 1 Chronicles 28. I want to turn there first. 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. One Chronicles 28. Verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. If thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. That's a great verse, that is. But I finish with 2 Corinthians 10. We need to learn this. Verse, we'll do three to five. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. Through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Here it comes. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's what we need to do. Bring every thought into the obedience of Christ. Discipline your thought life. Meditate on things that matter. Just looking at the cross-reference here. Oh yeah, and we'll finish with this, this is a beautiful verse. Jeremiah 45.5 seekest, And seekest thou great things for thyself, Seek them not. What a verse to finish with. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. God's will is what matters. We read about David. David should have been out there fighting. Instead, he was wandering, he was aimless, he was walking on a rooftop. And because of that, he lusted, he committed adultery, which led to murder, which led to a bereavement of a child, all because he wasn't doing what God told him to do, what he should have been doing. One wrong thing in your life can change your life. One little thing can change your life for the worse. That's why it's so important to take your thought life, everything that is against the Bible, against the Lord, and take it captivity and bring it into the obedience, every, uh, bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You control your mind. Yeah? Control your heart. Control your mouth. It's all connected. But it's the way you live. I don't know whether you really are a dedicated, committed Christian. You know, I can't judge you, you can't judge me. We, we just are before the Lord ourselves. I've got enough sin in my life to deal with, enough problems in my life to deal with. But I want to be committed. When I read Acts 20 and I see Paul's life and the ministry he did, man alive, he was so on fire for the Lord. And yet I meet hardly anybody. Hardly anybody in this life impresses me with their Christian walk. And that's tragic. And I want to, you know, I want to not just go around to impress people, of course not, but I want to live for the Lord so that I can, I can point people in the right direction. It's really tough and I mess up so often. But this is book, this is where it all starts from. You've got to get into this book. You've got to read the Bible. And you've got to ask God to help you to understand about life. Teach me, Lord, about life. And help me to make the right decisions. And we need the Lord to guide us rather than our selfish will. 
We don't want to be backslidden. Time's running out. The rapture could happen any time now. We want to be living right for Jesus Christ. Let's pray.